Okay, well, I'd like to get started. I'd like to welcome you today. This is an orientation session, the first of three identical orientation sessions that we're offering today uh, to get people started to think about the CompuCell workshop and hackathon that we're going to be holding uh, mainly from the last day of July till the end of the first week of August. And the reason for this is to get people familiar with the material that we're going to be covering in that workshop and to help people prepare so that you can have a maximal benefit from that workshop. I need to remind you that the talk today and also all of the workshop materials are live streamed on YouTube and archived and made it publicly available. So please be aware of that. Uh, the slide deck for today is available uh, at this website here. And uh, there's also a workshop Slack channel uh, that will be available for people to discuss. And Aiden is going to be putting the links for the various resources in the chat. So please take a look at that. Um, one of the crucial things to have ready before the main workshop, which is uh, simple, but I'll show you a little bit about later, is that you should have either a NanoHub account so that you can run CompuCell online uh, or download and install CompuCell 3D to your desktop if you plan to run it locally during the workshop. I'd like to thank our funding sources, the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation and NanoHub uh, for their support of this long-term project. So I'm going to start out by going over a little bit of course logistics. I'm going to talk quite a bit about the background uh, and some suggestions for reading to prepare for the course, talk a little bit about the hackathon and how it's organized, uh, some resources that you could use for CompuCell and background. And then we're going to do a little bit of a run through of CompuCell tools and show you a tiny bit of CompuCell as an exercise. And then we'll have an opportunity for some general questions uh, and ideas from people in the audience. Please try to remember to stay muted when you're not asking a question. Uh, you can ask questions also in the chat. Uh, we have about 130 people uh, registered for the workshop. Uh, we hope many of you will follow it all the way through. Uh, we'll do our best to support you. Our team will do our best to support you, but um, of course that's a large number of people to support at once. So we appreciate your patience. Uh, if you happen to be an experienced CompuCell user, and you're willing to help the beginners out uh, as a sort of an unofficial teaching assistant, we'd be most grateful. Uh, and you can tell us that you're interested, uh, hfinell at iu.edu, Aiden Fennell is helping with the organization of the course. So I'd like to welcome you. Uh, this course is going to talk about multi-cell modeling and the classic questions that are asked in multi-cell modeling have to do with organismal development. How do you go from a fertilized egg to an adult organism? What's called homeostasis in biology? How do you maintain the structure and function of an organism through its life? Which is why this picture of a mouse is the same picture twice. Uh, even though the components of the mouse aren't the same, the mouse as an adult is still a functional organism that persists. Uh, how do failures of homeostasis lead to illness? The classic example of what's called a developmental disease would be cancer, but there are many other diseases where failures of homeostasis are critical. Those could include things like autoimmune diseases, arthritis, diabetes, and some less common diseases as well. Infectious diseases, what happens when a virus or bacterium gets into the body? How does the tissue respond? How does the immune system respond? Toxicology, how do chemicals damage developing organisms or adult organisms? And also medicine and bioengineering, how can we create, control, or repair living organisms? Biology occurs across many, many scales from the individual molecules, the macromolecular machines, the subcellular organelles, the cellular organization, uh, signaling locally between cells large-scale multicellular structures that build tissues, 
organs, and then finally whole organisms. Uh, there is no computational way to include all of those scales in a single model. Uh, it's not practical. We can't model every atom in a cell or every cell in an organism. Uh, but we can build cross-scale models that explore the complexity of self-organization and repair and failure. Uh, the kinds of models that we're going to work on in this class are going to focus on scales going from uh, regulation of cell behaviors. Those would be network models of metabolism signaling and gene regulation through cell behaviors up till multicellular tissue organizations. We call these virtual tissues. And the classic example of a virtual tissue simulation might be what's shown here, the development of the somatic structure, sorry, I say somatic, somatic structure uh, in a chicken embryo. Here, we are building the structure that's eventually going to give rise to the periodic uh, segmental structure of the vertebra. This is controlled by a signaling network inside of the cell, which includes gene regulatory networks. Those networks in turn control what the cells do, how they move, how they change shape, how they differentiate, uh, how they adhere to each other. And we can then see that played out in a multicellular simulation. Uh, in the left, we have a simulation of the mechanics of the cells and their cell type. On the right-hand column, we have a model which is showing the subcellular oscillations of a particular molecule inside the cells. And in the middle, we have a gradient of an extracellular morphogen, a signaling molecule that's giving rise to the differentiation of the cells. And we can see that this leads to this periodic reorganization of the cells into this Semitic structure. This kind of virtual tissue modeling is very flexible. All of the models they'll show, of course, are using CompuCell because that's what we're going to be teaching. There are many other packages that do somewhat similar things. Uh, this is an old simulation showing the growth of a tumor and its interaction with blood vessels. Uh, the blood vessels are supplying oxygen. The tumor is supplying growth factors that cause the growth of new blood vessels here in purple. Uh, and that leads to particular changes in blood vessel organization and tumor morphology. Uh, this is a simulation of a developmental disease called polycystic kidney disease, not as well known as cancer, but has somewhat similar features. Uh, this is a study of diabetic retinopathy and its therapy. And this is another eye disease. This is called a retinal neovascularization, where the blood vessels behind the retina invade the retina and cause failure of retinal integrity. So uh, one thing that's rather a theme in many of the simulations that people do with CompuCell, although certainly not all of them, is the interaction of blood vessels and their behaviors with the surrounding tissue. This simulation here on the top of cancer, the retinal neovascularization simulation and diabetic retinopathy simulation are all simulations of blood vessel uh, defects of one sort or another in tissues, the different stages of life, different kinds of organization, uh, different organs. And this would be the typical example of the kinds of simulations that one can build uh, using CompuCell. We can build rather abstract models using CompuCell that illustrate general principles, for example, that cancer model. Uh, but you can also dive into the biology in detail and build highly detailed models. Um, these are some studies that were done by the US Environmental Protection Agency to predict chemical toxicity in embryos. And so this kind of modeling can be made quite explicit and quite realistic to understand, for example, blood vessel development uh, and its, its um, disorganization. Uh, by certain kinds of chemical perturbance. Um, this is a simulation of urogenital development uh, in the presence of estrogen mimics. Uh, here's a simulation of uh, the palate formation, that is the roof of the mouth uh, in uh, children, certain kinds of toxicants in the environment 
can lead to cleft palate where the bones and the roof of the mouth don't fuse properly. And this is a study of the biochemistry and play out of that kind of effect. And so you can go from very uh, computational theoretical models uh, to very uh, detailed models that try to understand the mechanism of action of particular chemicals in a particular biological context. We mentioned that CompuCell can be used to model infectious disease. This is a model of a patch of tissue in the lung. Uh, that tissue patch becomes infected uh, with a virus. Uh, the virus will spread in the tissue. It will call in immune cells, and those immune cells will then kill the infected cells, it's some uninfected cells. And you can try to understand the pattern of spread of infection, the possibility of tissue damage, and the role of drug therapies uh, to try to mitigate the damage from the infection. We hope at the end of the course, and it's a challenge in a week, that you'll be able to look at a complex biological problem and begin to ask quantitative questions that you can use models and simulations to answer. Uh, simulations aren't magic, they're very helpful, but designing them so that they're useful is not trivial. And one of the things that I think is most difficult is not actually building the computer simulations themselves, but understanding what simulations can and can't do to help you understand biological problems. We're going to, of course, talk about how to look at a biological system. Uh, we're focusing on multicellular systems, although CompuCell has been used to model single cells. It's even been modeled, used to model a non-living uh, mechanical prog um, materials properties. Um, but we'll primarily focus on how to look at multicellular systems, analyze them into their components and interactions, and translate them <clears throat> into executable simulations. And finally, we're going to talk about how to actually build simulations in a practical way. This is more computer programming um, using uh, the CompuCell tools, uh, Twitit and Player, uh, and the languages which <coughs> CompuCell uses to embody simulations, CC3DML, Python, and then a variety of subcellular modeling languages, uh, mainly Antimony, SBML, and more recently, MabBoss. And we'll talk certainly a bit about how to learn how to display and analyze simulation data to get meaningful results. If there are any questions, again, please put them in the chat. Uh, we'll have opportunity for a live discussion at the end of the session as well. I'll come back to course logistics for a second. Um, there are links for the Python bootcamp if you're not an experienced Python programmer, we highly recommend you take our one-day refresher course. Uh, if you've never used Python, we really recommend that you take the Python refresher course. That'll be on the Sunday, uh, the day before the workshop starts officially. Then we're going to have five days of the main workshop and a two-day hackathon the following weekend. Um, we're going to use the same Zoom link uh, for all of these workshops. We may have some secondary Zoom links uh, during the workshop proper. Uh, we'll announce that if it happens. Uh, there is a document uh, for the hackathon to help organize our thinking about that. And there's a Slack channel for the workshop as well, uh, which are going to be put into the chat here. All of these slides are available to you. So if you want to go back and look at the contents of the slides again, uh, you can do that without problem. I assume that if you're here, you've used Zoom probably in the past two years. You've used Zoom till the point that you can't stand it anymore. Uh, but just in case, uh, please do feel free to use the uh, feelings buttons in your participant screen. Yes, no, go slower, go faster, raise your hand. Uh, these are all available to you. Uh, we do monitor the participant screen and look for issues and questions that you may have. Uh, we're going to do uh, polling exercises. Uh, you'll see again and again during the workshop, a poll that will have the questions. How are you doing with the exercise? I'm done. I need more time. I need help and I'm not doing the exercise. Uh, that helps us keep the pacing of the course uh, appropriate. 
uh, it's important that you be able to do most of the exercises during the time allotted, uh, but not all. A lot of these exercises are pretty open-ended. Um, and so if you need to do some things offline, that's okay. Uh, the key thing is that we work pretty fast during the week that we have together. And therefore it's important not to get too far behind uh, on any given day. Uh, all the exercises are going to be made available uh, so that you can work on them offline. All videos and PowerPoints are available to review. Uh, and the sessions, again, are live streamed on YouTube and distributed on YouTube. It may take us a little while to have them edited, but the raw transcripts will be available immediately so that people want to review as possible. We have a large number of people who contribute to this workshop. Um, I'm James Blazier, professor here at Indiana University. Uh, TJ Sego, who's the lead developer of CompuCell, uh, is going to be teaching part of the workshop and will be available for help. Uh, professor Gilberto Tomas uh, from Brazil will be helping us out and uh, is also going to be giving some of the lectures. Uh, Pedro uh, Del Castel, also from Brazil, helped us last year, great teacher. Julio Belmonte uh, from North Carolina State will be giving many of the lectures. Uh, Jim Sluka here at IUB, who's an expert in toxicology, uh, will be helping out. Uh, Joshua Ponte Serrano, who is listed here as IUB, but is now a postdoctoral fellow at National Institutes of Health, will give some lectures. Uh, Priyam Adyapok, another postdoc uh, at Duke, will give some lectures. And Hayden Pinnell, who's an expert in Computing Education uh, will be helping us out through the whole workshop. There are going to be some additional speakers and assistants uh, who will come in and out. Uh, you will introduce them as they uh, become involved. And we thank all of you for your support. This is a purely volunteer effort uh, from the point of view of teaching. Uh, it's uh, wonderful that so many people help us every year. The course itself, will be given based on Eastern Daylight Time. Um, apologize to those of you who are in India or in Europe. Uh, there is no uh, way to get around time zones. Zoom may have abolished distance, but it hasn't abolished time zones. Uh, that's why we record things. Um, that's why we're giving multiple rounds of this orientation today. Um, we're going to start every day uh, with a brief Opportunity for questions and informal discussion, 9.45 a.m. Uh, U.S. Eastern Daylight Time. Uh, there'll be two modules in the morning, each of uh, 90 minutes, with a short break in between. There'll be a 45-minute opportunity for discussions, questions, and additional material. Um, a lot of that will have to do with the hackathon, we expect a lunch break, and then two additional modules of 90 minutes each, followed by a short opportunity for discussion and questions. And we're going to follow that rhythm for five days, Monday through Friday, and essentially also for the uh, Python workshop on the Sunday before the meeting. The tentative course outline is this. Uh, Sunday, July 31st, we're going to have our Python tutorial refresher again, Unless you're an expert Python user, I would recommend that you attend that. If it's familiar to you, you can tune out a little bit. Um, we don't use a lot of Python in this class. Uh, the level of Python that's needed is pretty basic, uh, but you need to be able to respond quickly to it. And so it's good to have some practice. Uh, the Monday, we will do introduction to using CompuCell, a little bit about the background philosophy, how CompuCell works starting working with uh, cells in the CompuCell environment. Uh, I'm going to give a little bit of background on how to translate biology into models, this principle of modeling idea on day two. We'll talk about chemical fields, how cells move, coupling fields uh, to cells. Uh, secretion and absorption, we'll do a little avascular tumor simulation. It's a classic simulation of this kind. We'll talk about how to build subcellular network models and how to connect them to cells, which is really where these kinds of simulations become very powerful. And then we're going to talk about more complex structures 
like compartmental cells to represent uh, nuclei and leading edges or epithelial cells, and the concept of links, uh, which gives us the ability to build complex uh, mechanical interactions in CompuCell. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how to organize CompuCell and call it as a library uh, to do large scale computing simulations and parameter exploration. Uh, we're going to have, as a new thing this year, we're going to have two uh, breakout sessions on Thursday and Friday. These are going to be outside speakers who published using CompuCell and who are going to be teaching their models and how to use them and build them. Uh, some of these will be uh, developmental biology, some of these will be toxicology, uh, some may be developmental diseases. And we're going to talk a little bit about optimization parameter fitting, and then we'll have two all day hackathon days on the 7th, 6th and 7th of August. Those will be uh, the Saturday and Sunday. So it's a long, a long week, Sunday through Sunday. Uh, but at the end of it, you should be able to build models. We're hoping that people will uh, use the opportunity of today uh, to begin to do some preparation. Uh, the course is designed to be self-contained, but it does, as I say, move pretty fast. And so the more you can do in advance, uh, the more value we think you'll get out of the course. Uh, we'll do our best to support you. Uh, we'll be available for questions and technical issues uh, in advance of the workshop and during the workshop and after the workshop. Um, and again, uh, if we really have 130 people show up, uh, you may need to be a little bit patient with your response. But one thing to remember is that if you have a question or a problem, somebody else almost always has the same question and problem. So please don't be shy about asking for help. I want to talk a little bit about the background and knowledge uh, that would be helpful going into this course. And I should say that one of the things that makes this course both a pleasure and a challenge is that you need to know something about a lot of different topics. And almost nobody comes to this course knowing everything they need to build the kind of multicellular models and apply them that uh, we do. Over the years, we've had everything from high school students to emeritus professors take this course. We've had everything from pure mathematicians to surgeons take the course. Uh, that diversity is a great strength. And especially when we did this in person, uh, we would definitely try to team people up with different backgrounds so that people could educate each other. It's a little bit more challenging to do that uh, online uh, but the Slack channels do allow you as students to communicate with each other. And so we strongly urge you to ask questions in the Slack and to have a hive mind approach to learning from each other. Uh, but it's also necessary to the extent that you can uh, to try to fill in the areas where you feel that you might have uh, need of additional support. There's a general concept of principles of modeling that I mentioned. Uh, there's some basic programming. Again, the level of sophistication in Python is not high, but some is needed. Uh, there's some basic biology that's important to learn. Uh, some physics and biophysics is helpful. And a little bit of mathematics. We'll try to minimize the amount of mathematics that you need. Uh, CompuCell is designed to try to minimize the programming and mathematics that are required uh, but having some more programming and mathematics will certainly enrich your understanding of the things you're doing and make them easier. Um, the key things and principles of modeling are how do we go from the complexity of a real biological system, here we've got a picture of the liver, uh, to an abstraction, biologists love diagrams, uh, and that diagramming is a critical kind of modeling. It's not computational modeling, but it's uh, conceptual modeling. Here, I'm showing the architecture flow in the liver, in particular, uh, to a mathematical model, which could represent that flow. How can we define questions that models can answer? Because different kinds of models address different kinds of questions. And there may be biological questions that modeling can't help with. 
And so we do have to think carefully about what it is we're trying to understand and how models can be useful to that uh, to be able to do something meaningful. We can't just say we're going to model a liver because that is too undefined. We have to ask a question, how does the flow in the liver affect the rate at which a particular drug is delivered to particular parts of the liver, for example? And that means we have to be able to think about variables, methods of quantifying the things that we care about, flow rates, dosing, birth and death rates of cells, mechanical structures of tissues, and so on. We have to think about how to conceptualize models. Again, biologists are very good, typically at going from the organism itself to diagrams. That's a huge help. And if you've done that, you've already won the hardest part of modeling models. Uh, once you've decided on what you're going to model in that sense, you have to build model structures. Uh, there's this fourfold diagram that we like to use. The things in the universe you're going to model and what properties they have, because in a computation, you have to define what those are, how those things interact and behave, the initial and boundary conditions, how things start out, what happens in the outside world to affect them, and then how things change continuously in time, dynamics, and discreetly in time, events. Continuous dynamics might be the metabolism of a cell. An event might be something like a cell division or taking a drug on a periodic schedule. We have to think about how to map these real-world objects to mathematical abstractions. CompuCell tries to help you with that. Uh, then when we're thinking about the interface between subcellular and cellular behaviors, we have to think about how to build network diagrams and implement those. We have to think about what the limits of our models are. They can't do everything. Uh, how to validate and falsify models, because we want these things to be scientific and how we can use them then to understand hypotheses in a biological sense uh, and to learn either scientifically as an engineer, as a drug developer, how to use these models to understand and control biological systems. In Python, we need to know just the basics. We need to know uh, the basic syntax. Python depends on indentation rather than parentheses. So you have to get used to that. We need to know Python loops. Loops in Python are a little different from loops in other languages. Um, logic and conditionals, if statements, and so on. If you've programmed in another language besides Python, you probably know most of these things. Python has most of these concepts similarly to something like C++ or Java, but it's not quite identical. And so it's helpful to know how Python does things. Um, there are two fundamental Python concepts that we use a lot. Um, most of them are very elementary. The one that's slightly less elementary is the concept of dictionary. Uh, Python dictionaries are a very powerful uh, computational construct, um, and we use them a lot. So if you haven't run into dictionaries as an idea, it's useful to review that. Um, CompuCell objects are organized in something called classes. It's useful to know about those. Uh, scoping and inheritance, how what variables are available where. I uh, will discuss that when we come to it, but uh, having a little bit of familiarity with those ideas is helpful. Um, and again, you don't need to know a lot of Python. CompuCell is designed to minimize the amount you do need to know, uh, but we use those few concepts quite frequently. And so it's helpful to have some background there. Biology is really what we're talking about here. And so the basic biology of multicellular organization is critical. And so you don't necessarily need to know a lot of genetics. We're not doing omics here. We're not doing bioinformatics. But having an idea of what cells are and what they do, how cells generate forces, how tissues are built through cell-cell and cell extracellular adhesion, uh, what the difference between say an epithelial and a mesenchymal tissue is, what cell polarity and planar polarity are, what is extracellular matrix, what are the basic ways cells signal, uh, control their metabolism and regulate their gene expression, uh, 
Those are important concepts and how cells signal to each other and interact are important concepts. If you're interested in the subcellular elements of organization of tissues, um, concepts of things like motifs uh, can be very useful. And then going upscale, uh, what are the cell level characteristics, for example, of blood vessels or cancer are useful things to know. And more generally, how do biologists think about biology? How do they represent information? And again, I'm not thinking so much about bioinformatics and the lists that bioinformatics uses, but rather the concept of diagramming the interactions and components of biology that you'll see in any biology textbook. I'm very fond of uh, Gilbert, Developmental Biology. It's a wonderful textbook. I always recommend going online to Amazon or another uh, secondhand book dealer. Don't buy the latest edition for $300. Buy a 20-year-old edition for $3. Uh, that will have all of the basic concepts in it, a lot less detail. And this is, if you're trying to introduce yourself to biology, it's a wonderful way to do it. We're going to try to minimize the amount of physics you need, but all of the modeling we're going to do is based on physics. We're going to have the idea of force generation. We're going to have the idea of compressibility, uh, elasticity, um, generally the idea of constraints, uh, which is how computation actually implements biological features. Um, we're going to talk a lot about chemical fields, in particular diffusing fields, and the idea of a diffusion length and a diffusion time. And so if those are unfamiliar concepts, uh, those are things that you might want to review. Again, you don't need these in great detail. We're talking about perhaps a Wikipedia level knowledge of these ideas. Uh, we will cover them uh, in class, but again, we go pretty fast. And so having seen the ideas before is quite useful. Uh, force velocity relations and constitutive relations, that is, if I push on something, how does it move, are useful. Uh, CompuCell uses something called the cellular POTS or GGH model, uh, intrinsic methodology that has its own uh, issues and peculiarities. Um, you don't need to know how that works to be able to use CompuCell, but when things go wrong, it's helpful because it'll help you understand why they're not working. Uh, and so if you have a background in physics or an interest in physics, understanding statistical mechanics, Ising model and Boltzmann functions is useful, uh, but it's absolutely not necessary. You don't have to have that understanding. Uh, something about how fluctuations determine relaxation and mobility could be useful. Uh, and so any of these fundamentals of biophysics can be helpful. Uh, again, we try to minimize the amount you need to know that in the class, uh, but if you're going to go on and use these methods in your research, uh, having some of that background is helpful. Mathematics, again, we try to hide the math uh, to the extent that's possible. At the network level, you have one into more mathematics than you do at the multicellular level. Uh, but knowing what simple ordinary differential equations and rate laws are is very helpful. Uh, we've seen the diffusion equation before. Uh, really knowing how the diffusion equation works is very valuable. Uh, we're dealing with stochastic equations here, uh, having some basic idea of how probabilities and rates work in stochastic systems is helpful. And then, as I mentioned, uh, if you're interested in signaling, metabolism, and gene regulation, uh, having some idea about how to do network modeling uh, is great. Uh, Herbert Sauro is teaching a course in the third week of July, a week-long course in this. It's also a free open course. Uh, I strongly recommend that. Herbert and I have co-taught courses for many, many years. These pictures are really about Herbert's course more than ours. Um, and the idea of stability and fixed points and sensitivity analysis, uh, which comes out of those kind of networks models can be very useful. Uh, also at the level of multicellular organization, although it's not essential. So if you think that you might want to fill in on any of these topics, there are many places you can look. 
There's a nice paper in class computational biology called 10 Simple Rules for Your Mathematical Model, written by a group of Canadian students. It's not really focused on multicellular modeling or agent-based modeling, uh, but it has some great ideas, and I strongly recommend that. Uh, we also have uh, a little bit of uh, an essay that I wrote uh, that you might want to look at. Uh, for Python, uh, there are some nice introductory textbooks available. Uh, you can find lots of online material. I find for learning, testing yourself to learn whether you've got the Python under your belt. Uh, Rosalind is a free online set of Python exercises and problems in the context of bioinformatics. I think it's great. Um, the network modeling we're going to use will be mostly using the Tellurium language and anti, sorry, Tellurium environment and antimony language. Uh, those are free open source packages. Uh, there's a great set of demos and introductions that you can get uh, from Herbert Sauro. Uh, the demos are free. The textbook is cheap. Uh, mathematical biology. There are a lot of good basic articles on Wikipedia. Um, there are a number of good introductory textbooks. Uh, again, I mentioned Gilbert Developmental Biology, especially the older editions, is a great place to familiarize yourself with basic biological concepts. Uh, but again, Wikipedia has most of what you need. Uh, I think the best biophysics textbook is Phil Nelson's Physical Models of Living Systems. Uh, that's a little bit challenging if you're coming from biology and don't have some physics background, uh, but there are a number of others as well. Uh, for a more sophisticated text, I think Physical Biology of the Cell is fantastic. Um, that's the one I used to teach out of as a graduate level when I taught biophysics. If you want to learn more about the underlying uh, engine of CompuCell, uh, we have a paper that's available um, online as well. If you find any resources uh, or support that you think are useful, especially if they're free or open source, but even if they're commercial, uh, please do let us know and we'll share them with the community as we go forward. So for course resources itself, we have the CompuCell website. Uh, there is a download for CompuCell if you want to install it on your local computer. Uh, there are online manuals. Um, the best one to work with is this Python scripting manual, uh, currently up to 4.2.4. Um, we're a small team, so sometimes the manuals get a little bit out of date. And so if you find problems in the manuals, please let us know. We'll do our best to update. There's an old uh, introduction to CompuCell called uh, CC3D Quick Start Guide. It's really old, it dates to CompuCell 3.6. Um, but most of the information and exercises work. And so if you want to uh, try some CompuCell out on your own, uh, working with that will give you a series of simple exercises uh, that you can do, uh, and the exercises will still work. Sometimes the code that's illustrated is slightly out of date, uh, but they'll still work. For the course itself, uh, we have Slack channel, uh, Google Drive, where we'll share all of the course materials, recordings, slide decks, exercises, student comments, and so on. And there'll be a dedicated CompuCell 3D website uh, for this course. Uh, for the subcellular modeling for antimony and tellurium, uh, Herbert Sauer has a wonderful set of documentation, tellurium.readthedocs.io, which I strongly recommend. And there also are quick reference guides available in the course materials for Python, for tellurium antimony, and for CompuCell itself. Uh, CC3D quick reference guide in particular is worth reading. I just read it through. Uh, you'll get all the basic concepts and you'll be familiar then with the uh, key ideas before we get too much involved. The Slack channel is a great way to communicate. Uh, we'll try to monitor it, but people should also use it as an opportunity to build a community among yourselves. And so I do recommend that people uh, subscribe to the Slack uh, as soon as possible, get started thinking about uh, 
learning issues. And I hope that that's helpful to you. Uh, the quick reference guides, as I mentioned, uh, there's a Python cheat sheet that has more than all the Python you'll need, uh, but it's about five pages. Uh, really only the first two are going to be critical plus dictionaries. Uh, there's the CompuCell quick reference guide that again has the key ideas that we're going to cover in CompuCell. And then the Tellurium Antimony uh, quick reference guide as well. I strongly recommend that you print those out uh, and have them on your desk as hard copies to reference so that during the class, you don't have to keep going back and forth between screens online. It's hard to have Zoom up and your code up and be looking for material at the same time. So I do recommend printing those out. Uh, if you want to dig in a little bit more, I mentioned we have a somewhat old but uh, relatively extensive discussion of how CompuCell works under the hood, uh, this magnetization to morphogenesis chapter. And I mentioned before this nice general introduction to modeling by this group of Canadian students. Uh, that I think is uh, quite useful. Again, it's not identical to what we need, uh, but is a very good first step to thinking about computation. Are there any questions about the organization of the main course before I move on? You can put any questions you like in the chat. Okay. One of the things that we started uh, two years ago, which was pretty successful, uh, was having a hackathon where we worked intensively uh, for two days uh, to try to develop uh, preliminary models uh, for real research projects. And our hope is not everyone, we don't have to, have to participate in the hackathon to participate in the class, uh, certainly not required, uh, but if you're interested in the hackathon, our idea is to organize effective and uh, diverse teams uh, with about three to six members each. Fewer than three, you really don't have the critical mass to make it work. More than six, it becomes unwieldy. And um, we're going to ask people to pitch ideas for the hackathon. Uh, if you want to participate, you don't have to have an idea. You can join a team without pitching an idea. Uh, but our goal is to facilitate people uh, building working models in two days. That's challenging, but it can be done. And there are people who published uh, research papers in major journals uh, based on the work they started in this hackathon. Again, the hackathon is going to be mainly August 6th and August 7th all day, uh, but it does require preparation, uh, at least on the part of the people who are leading teams, uh, to be a team member, not so much perhaps. We're going to have two opportunities, July 13th and July 25th, for you to pitch your ideas. We're going to ask you if you want to lead a team uh, to prepare a lightning talk of three minutes, five slides, we'll send out a rubric uh, for those slides that you want to uh, present your idea. We're going to ask you to upload that pitch to a shared folder. There's also going to be a document where we're going to ask you to write a little written description of your project. We're going to look through those and select a preliminary list of feasible projects. Uh, again, we need to have teams that are big enough so we can't have everybody going off and doing a one-person project. Uh, sometimes people have great ideas that don't work very well with CompuCell or aren't practical in the time frame that we have for the hackathon. We don't want people to be frustrated. And so we'll do our best to guide people uh, to projects that are manageable. We may come up with some project suggestions of our own uh, from our end that might be useful for people. And uh, there'll also be an opportunity at the beginning of the workshop proper uh, to suggest additional ideas if people aren't able to do the July 5th, 13th or 25th um, pitches. Um, what we'll ask people to do who want to participate in the hackathon is to pick uh, the top three projects um, from the potential list uh, that we've identified. We'll suggest teams uh, the beginning of the main workshop 
Um, people can move around. It's not, we're not going to force people to do things they don't want to do, uh, but we'll do our best to guide people into functional groups to maximize the probability of success. Uh, we'll have the Slack channels and Zooms. Uh, please people use them effectively. During the hackathon proper, we'll have check-ins in the morning and the noon. Uh, in the evenings, we'll ask for brief written reports so we can help people. And at the end of the hackathon on Sunday, we'll ask everyone to do an oral presentation and model documentation. Uh, we'll work with people after the hackathon to try to make sure that they can develop those ideas further uh, with the goal, perhaps, of publishable results. And as I say, this has happened. We've seen this happen in the past. Uh, people have come up with ideas that have led to uh, published papers. If you have a hackathon idea, you can put it on the Slack channel. We've created a document where you can put up a few paragraphs explaining your idea. There's a rubric for that. Uh, and then we ask you to, as much as possible, either present on the 13th or the 25th. Um, Again, there'll be some overflow. So if you don't have an idea ready by then, you'll be able to present during the workshop proper. Uh, but the earlier you start uh, present, organizing your idea and creating your team, the more effective that's likely to be. Third question? Third question? So for the hackathon expectations, uh, we would like uh, you to explain what it is you want to model and why, uh, something that explains your background and skills. Uh, it's okay if your answer is that you don't have any and you're looking for a team to join, that's fine. Uh, we'll do our best to support you through the hackathon. Um, if you're going to do the hackathon, we strongly encourage you to work a little bit on your Python now. Uh, we strongly recommend trying to get through the Rosalind exercises one through five, uh, what they call the Python village uh, to get prepared. Okay, so that was the course logistics. I'd like to do a quick CompuCell mini tutorial. Um, CompuCell is, uh, consists of two main programs, a Twitit++, which is a model editor, uh, that helps you build uh, computer simulations. And its main feature is that it contains what are called code snippets. Uh, it contains boilerplate code to do most of the things that you do most of the time. Uh, often the hardest thing is to find where in the menu structure uh, the thing you want to do is hiding. Uh, but almost everything that you'll want to do has a template. And so you don't have to do a lot of remembering of Python. There's also CC3D Player, which is a tool for running and visualizing models. Uh, it has uh, perhaps too many settings and options. Uh, you can save movies, you can save time series of data, um, you can change how things are rendered in two and three dimensions, and you can even change the way simulations operate as they run. And these are the two basic interaction tools that we're going to be using. You don't have to have CompuCell installed before the workshop, but we strongly encourage you to do it. Um, there are two ways to use CompuCell. Uh, one of them is on, a line, uh, is on your desktop. The other one is uh, running it remote on the NanoHub servers. The NanoHub servers are free uh, they're online, and when I'm teaching, I'm primarily going to be teaching using the NanoHub deployment. And the reason that we're going to focus on the NanoHub deployment is that everyone sees the same thing, whereas the desktop is a little bit different depending on whether you're running Windows, Mac, or Linux. And with some Mac systems and some uh, Linux systems, uh, there are problems with uh, compatibility. And so if you have a Linux or a Mac system and you try to do a desktop install and it doesn't happen immediately, I strongly encourage you, at least for the lifetime of the course, to use the NanoHub deployment. Um, 
One thing we cannot probably do during the workshop is troubleshoot uh, installation issues on your computers. We'll have a little bit of help for that, but fundamentally, um, if you can't get CompuCell locally installed, we strongly recommend using the NanoHub deployment. I'm going to show you quickly how to do uh, the NanoHub CompuCell. And I'd ask people to follow along if possible. Um, NanoHub is a shared open source resource. It's available to anybody. Uh, you do have to register. And so that's uh, necessary, uh, but uh, it is uh, was developed by the National Science Foundation, the United States. And I strongly recommend that even if you're going to use the desktop version, you create a NanoHub account. And so what I'm going to do now is, let's see if I can get this to work. I'm going to come to NanoHub here. I'm gonna redo the screen share for a second. And when you come to NanoHub for the first time, you can do um, nanohub.org slash tools slash cc3d base 4x, the name of the general CompuCell tool. The first time you do that, it will ask you to register and create a, an account. Um, once you've registered and created an account, you'll have something called a dashboard, and that will look something like this. And we'll come back to that. Uh, logging into NanoHub, the homepage of NanoHub looks like this. Uh, there's a login button. If you hit the login button, you can create an account. Uh, you can create through, if you're in the US, through an affiliated institution. If you're not in the US, you can sign in with Google or you can create an account in another way. And so I strongly recommend that everybody do that. Uh, it'll take you about five to 10 minutes to do. Uh, if you have problems with it, you can go to the NanoHub help team. They have their own dedicated staff uh, to help make sure you can get online. Uh, you don't wanna to have to lose time and uh, frustrate, we have frustrations during the workshop proper uh, getting into NanoHub. So I strongly recommend that you do that after this class today. Once you've been able to log in, you'll have the dashboard. Uh, within the dashboard, if you need to get back to dashboard, you can hover over NanoHub here uh, or over here on the right. You can go under logged in, and pull down the dashboard. Uh, the dashboard, this is not the most sophisticated system, not as fancy as something like Colab. Uh, it's been around a lot longer, but it is free and open. And that's the reason we like it. Once you're in it, uh, you can go to my tools here. Uh, the first time you go here, you can go to all tools and you can search on CompuCell cell 3D V4 main tool. Let's see if I found it. There's no, did I misspell something? I left out the, there we go. Stop yourself 3D. It'll pull up all of the possibilities. And, and once you've found here, Comp Yourself 3D main tool, you can hit the little heart button to bookmark it. Uh, we can come back here and once you've found it, you can hit this button here to open it. I'll hit it open. That'll launch a new window. Initially, you'll see a black box and a blue box. And again, if people would like to try this, um, I can give people a minute uh, to try it out. And here you'll have CompuCell open uh, in uh, a browser window. And so why don't I just do a quick poll since I haven't done a poll yet, I'll see if people are gonna to try to do this. If you don't wanna do it now, that's okay. You can do it afterwards, but I do encourage you to do that. So one person, two people say they've got it working. 
three. One person is not doing the exercise. Six people say they're doing it. Okay, so that looks like that worked out pretty well for most people. Okay, once CompuCell has run, you'll be able to run a CompuCell here. Hitting that button will run CompuCell. This is a particular simulation that I already have loaded. If you want to install CompuCell 3D on your desktop, um, you can go to the CompuCell homepage here. You can click on binaries, and then you'll have an index which says um, most recent release. And for example, if I want to go to the Windows release, I'm a Windows person, not a Mac person. Uh, click here on the Windows release, and I can go to here, CC3D CompuCell download. Click here on download. And it'll take me to SourceForge where I can pull down the most recent releases of CompuCell. Uh, for Windows and Macs, you'll have a slightly different uh, process. And uh, if you really want to compile your own, uh, the source code is available online. But I would strongly recommend against doing that if you don't have to. Um, it's time consuming and complicated. Uh, and the one button installers that we have work pretty well. There's a good point, which is if you're registering for NanoHub, uh, definitely you should use an email address that you have as a permanent email address, like a Gmail account. Uh, don't use something that's labeled because it, it, you'll wind up having to create a new NanoHub account. NanoHub accounts are locked to email addresses. Good point. Okay, uh, the download here again is available for a variety of uh, flavors and installations of uh, your operating system. Um, one thing that you'll find both on Windows and Macs, uh, Windows is a little easier than Macs, is that because we are not a certified uh, application you'll have to uh, overwrite the security when you do your install. So when you, uh, on a Windows machine, if you hit uh, install, uh, it'll give you a security warning and you'll have to do run as administrator uh, to get the installation to work. Uh, there's documentation of all the details, um, but uh, as time has gone on, uh, the security uh, on both Windows and Macs has gotten more complicated to address. And so you have to notice that the fact that it warns you about the system being insecure should not prevent you from doing the install. Okay. Questions about that so far? All right. Let's quickly, in our last few minutes, uh, use the uh, CompuCell to read and write a model. Uh, we're going to use Twitit plus plus. So let's come back to our NanoHub install of CompuCell. We're going to use Twitit plus plus to create a simple simulation. And I'll do it in the NanoHub version. The first thing that I have to do uh, is that CompuCell launches with CompuCell player tool open. Um, we have to switch to Twitit++. And to do that, uh, we can either go to the file menu and hit start Twitit here, or we can see this uh, picture of a pen and ink, uh, which will also take us to Twitit. So here I'm going to start Twitit. And you should see a new window pop up. It'll say untitled.txt. And put it plus plus five at the top. And let me just see if people are able to do that.
anybody has a problem with that, put it in the chat. Okay, good. One thing that you may find in the NanoHub deployment is that sometimes the screen doesn't redraw properly. And I may have a problem because sometimes the Twitter doesn't, uh, the NanoHub deployment doesn't interact well with um, Zoom. Uh, but if you have a screen redraw issue, if you grab the bottom right corner of your window and drag it, that will force a redraw. So, if you get a strange looking screen, pulling that bottom right corner uh, will force a redraw of the screen, a refresh. Okay, well, now that we're in Twitit, we're going to use the wizard function to build a simulation. And to do that, we're going to go to CC3D project. We're going to pull down the menu and we're going to say new CC3D project, the first line here. So everybody can do that. And it will pop up a dialogue which will build a computer simulation. I want to make sure everybody can get to that point. So I'm going to relaunch the poll. You're going to get used to seeing this poll a lot of times in the next month. Okay. When you do this, you need to make sure for your simulation directory that your simulation directory points to your user space and not to the root directory uh, in NanoHub. So you should hit uh, browse and make sure you're not pointing at computer, but pointing at whatever your username is. Because the root directory isn't writable on NanoHub. NanoHub is actually a Linux installation. And we need to give our computer simulation a name. It could be something like my first simulation. I strongly encourage you not to use any special characters or uh, spaces in the names of files, especially because it's a Linux box. So we're going to type that name. We'll hit next. And we'll have a menu that would allow us to say how big the simulation is, how long it lasts, and a variety of other details. We're going to leave those all by their defaults. So we'll hit next. And then what happened? Something skipped. I'm sorry about that. OK. Sorry about that. The, my, my mouse seems to be doing double clicks by mistake. So uh, skipped over. Hit next, you should be at a window called cell type specification. We're going to create two cell types. This is a window that allows us to define the types of cells in our simulation. We can just call them cell one, hit add, and cell two, hit add. That clear? Okay, and we'll hit next. We're not going to use any chemical fields, so we'll hit next, skip. And then we're going to have to define what the main cell properties and behaviors are. We're going to have the cells stick to each other, so we're going to hit contact here. We're going to have cells grow, so we hit growth. We're going to have cells divide, so we hit mitosis. And we hit volume local flex. And nothing exists in these simulations unless we say that it's there. So if we want the cells to have a volume, we have to say they have a volume. So should every, I want to make sure everybody can get through that. So I'll relaunch the poll. If there are any questions, I can roll it back and we can go over things again. OK. 
Okay. Now I hit next and it'll tell me configuration is complete. I hit finish. I'll see my editor window, my first simulation here. I double click on that and it will open the code for the simulation that was generated. And I'll see that the simulation consists of an XML component, a Python a master component, which we'll almost never look at, and something called my first simulation, steppables.py. If I want to save the simulation, I hit this double floppy disk icon here, which is a save all. Or I can pull down CC3D Python, sorry, C3, CC3D project, and hit save or save as if I want to version it. Or I can hit save here as well with the up arrow and the down arrow. To run the simulation, I can click on my simulation, right click and hit open in player. Uh, if player is not running, I can click on the CC3D icon here. Um, and I can also uh, in the, it'll ask me here because I have another simulation running if I want to stop it. And I need in the, in the uh, NanoHub version, I need to switch between the tabs. And here is going to be now the new simulation. It'll look like this. I've done some resizing already. Uh, to resize, you can pull on the corners of your simulation boxes. Uh, you can resize the sub windows of your viewers. Uh, you can use the minimize and maximize functions as well. So the standard, the standard uh, window manipulations will work. Within the player, you have uh, four buttons that control the simulation. Run runs the simulation. Pause, pauses the simulation. The record button actually does a single step. So this does a single time step in the simulation. Stop, terminates the simulation and resets everything to the beginning. So I don't recommend doing a stop unless you know you're done with the simulation. Normally you'll use pause uh, while you're actually doing things. And that is all it took to write your first CompuCell simulation. And here I will, in fact, let me restart the simulation. I'll stop it and start it again. Unfortunately, the window resizes, which is not the most convenient thing in the world here. Let's see if it, it may have crashed on me here. Huh? Let me stop it and see if it will. Play. This is probably a redraw error. Here. There we go. This is the initial configuration of the simulation. Let me resize things so you can see a little bit better. There's a nice function here in Windows called Tile that will adjust the windows inside of the player to be visualizable. So I'll hit play. And what I'll see is simulate cells growing, dividing, and differentiating. So that's the basic simulation. Let me just show you quickly what CompuCell code looks like. What is the code that actually generates this simulation, which is the basis of a simple cancer simulation. And we'll have a week of going into the details. So don't worry if it doesn't all make sense immediately. I'm going to come back to the editor. Uh, CompuCell simulations have two main components, a CC3D markup language specification of static aspects of the simulation and a Python specification of dynamic aspects. We can switch between the two by clicking either on the tabs here or double clicking here in the navigation bar. 
Uh, you can scroll within the windows. You can change the size of the fonts and things of this kind as well. And you'll have you can play around a little bit with the options that you have. One thing maybe I should have said beforehand in the simulation itself, uh, there are a lot of configuration options for the display. This button here that has a screwdriver and a wrench uh, gives me display options, saving images, general settings, uh, cell colors, rendering fields, which we don't have here, things to do in 3D, which we're not using as well. There are a bunch of options that you have here. Come back to the editor for a second. Um, we've got the scroll bar here. We can resize our components. Let's look at the markup language for a second. The markup language consists of a block called metadata that tells us about parallelization because CompuCell is intrinsically uh, OpenMP multi-threaded. A block called POTS that gives us the size of the lattice that the simulation is run on, how long it runs. Um, for example, here, dimensions, it's run on a 256 by 256 by one lattice. If it were 3D, it could be 256 by 256 by 256. That specifies the initial uh, size of the lattice. The next thing that we have are a list of the types of cells we defined uh, medium, which is always the background uh, unspecified cell type. Uh, we have cell one and cell two, which is what we defined when we wrote the simulation in the first place. Uh, we have a statement that the cells have a volume here as well. And we can see those cell types again if we go back to my first simulation. Medium is black, cell one is red, cell two is green. And then we have a specification of the properties of the cells. In this case, the only thing that they're going to do is have a contact energy. That is, they're going to stick to each other in the outside environment. Here, we've made all of the contact energies equal. In a realistic system, we have different energies for different cell types. And we can change those contact energies on the fly when we're running a simulation. Uh, by opening up uh, the appropriate plugin here, contact energy. One minor annoyance is that you don't see the names until you pull them down. So I can say the contact energy between medium and cell one, uh, medium and cell two, cell two and cell two. So I can change the parameters of the simulation on the fly as I run. And then I have an initialization. Uh, CompuCell doesn't have the most sophisticated initializers. You can do those things in Python uh, if you need to, uh, but it allows you to draw things like a circle of cells or a square of cells. Here, uniform initializer draws a square box or rectangular box of cells. I can specify the size of the cells. Um, the size of the box, the first two lines, um, the size of the cells and the width, whether there's a space between them or not, which cell types I want, those will be randomly allocated. And that'll create that initial condition that I had here. Let me run that one more time so you can see the initial condition. I don't know why that pulling that corner always takes a little bit more effort than it should. Eh, not gonna behave. Yeah. You can see that square initial condition with the random distribution of the two cell types. The second part of CompuCell is the Python. Uh, we'll switch to the Python here. A lot of this is boilerplate that we don't really need to worry about at the moment, but I do want to uh, call your attention to just a few basic concepts here. Uh, the start function is run once at the beginning of the simulation uh, to set up initial conditions. And you'll see here the line four cell 
in self.cell list. That does something to every cell in the simulation. Here we assign the cell a target volume and a lambda volume. We haven't talked about what lambda volume means. It's the inverse compressibility of the cell, if you want to know. Uh, but this is essentially saying that our cells have an initial volume of 25 units, in this case, abstract units in the simulation. The next thing that we have is a step function. The step function is run once every step of the simulation. We can adjust how frequently. And we see here four cell and self.cell list, cell.target volume equals one. This makes our cells grow. And you could easily play with that growth rate, if you like, to explore its consequences. Something that's rather powerful is this mitosis steppable. Uh, this creates, does cell division for you. Uh, we create an empty list. This is a Python concept of a list. Uh, we say that we're going to divide cells if they get bigger than 50 units. Uh, we put them onto a stack of a list of cells to divide. And then we go through that list of cells to divide and we divide them with random orientation. So that's how we do cell division. Once a cell has divided, we have to say what happens to its attributes. We say that the daughter cells each have half of the parent's volume and otherwise they're the same, except that if the parent cell was of type one, they make the daughter cell of type two and vice versa. So if they had a green cell, one of the daughter cells is green, one is red. If we had a red cell, one of the daughter cells is red and one is green. That's why we get the alternating colors. And that's the basic idea of the simulation. So again, to prepare for the class, uh, make sure that you can launch CC3D either locally or on NanoHub. Uh, you might play with trying to load, edit, and saving simulations of the kind that we did here. Uh, there are demos, a lot of demos in CompuCell. Um, I strongly recommend trying out uh, the CompuCell, cell, CompuCell Python tutorial steppables based mitosis which is basically what we've just done here. There's a nice demo called, in the book chapters demos, angiogenesis. And if you want to understand a little bit about how signaling is done in CompuCell, you could run the Delta Knot simulation. Strongly recommend that you try uh, reviewing some of the core concepts we discussed. Uh, you don't need to be an expert, but knowing a little bit about each one of those topics will help you out a lot. For the, for the workshop. And if you're planning on participating in the hackathon, please do think about a project you want to do or one you might want to join. Uh, be prepared to present your idea if you want to pitch an idea on the 13th or the 25th of July. Uh, you'll have other opportunities after that, but the earlier you get started, the more likely you are to build a team and succeed on it. And so that really is the end of my presentation. Are there any questions? either about the main meeting or the hackathon that we can answer now for you. You feel free to unmute at this point if you want to ask a question or you can type the question in the chat. If people have any suggestions for ways in the future to make this presentation better uh, or something that wasn't intelligible, uh, please let us know by email. I'll put my email in the chat and uh, we can also have, um, we can also have, um, Uh, Hayden put his email in the chat if you have any questions. So my email is jaglazier at gmail.com. 
And Hayden, could you reshare the Slack, the Slack channel as well? Uh, yeah. For discussions. Okay, well, I don't see any additional questions. I hope I'll be seeing some of you on the 13th and the 25th and more of you uh, on the uh, main workshop starting on the 30th of July. Thank you very much for joining us today. And I appreciate your interest in the project.